Well, we're in our fourth mini-series on the millennium, the coming thousand-year reign of Christ, and we're briefly examining the key covenants, the covenants by which God moves His redemptive plan forward, and as they relate to the coming millennium, we spent a couple of evenings looking at the Abrahamic covenant, how God made specific long-range unconditional promises to Abraham, Promises of a land and a nation, promises of a seed, and promises of a blessing. So turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 7. And tonight we want to look at another major covenant that relates directly to the millennium. And that is God's covenant with King David. To make this as digestible as possible, we're just going to do this in three parts tonight. I want to show you the promise of the Davidic covenant... Then we'll look at the details of the Davidic covenant, and then we'll look at the connection to the millennium. So the promise of the covenant, the details of the covenant, and the connection to the millennium. Now, many have written terrific and detailed explanations of the Davidic covenant. I'm not going to try to replicate that in one evening. My goal is just to kind of give you a flavor for the importance of God's covenant with King David of Israel and show you that this covenant demonstrates that the the coming kingdom of God on earth is future, it's literal, and it's centered on Christ physically ruling on the earth. And so first, let's look at the promise of the Davidic covenant. 2 Samuel 7, beginning in verse 1. Now it happened when the king inhabited his house, and Yahweh had given him rest on every side from all his enemies... That the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I inhabit a house of cedar, but the ark of God inhabits tent curtains. David the king, in a time of having dominion over all of his enemies, he laments that he has a palace and God is uh, represented by the ark of God, still inhabiting the traveling worship center, the, the tabernacle, the tent. And this hurts David. And so, Nathan the prophet, God's representative to David, he gives his stamp of approval. Verse 3, so Nathan said to the king, go, do all that is in your heart, for Yahweh is with you. But Nathan the prophet made a critical error. He represented God without consulting God first. Verse 4, now it happened the same night that the word of Yahweh came to Nathan, saying... Go and say to my servant David, thus says Yahweh, are you the one who would build me a house to inhabit? And so in very kind fashion, God corrects Nathan's presumption and he tells him to tell David that he was wrong to assume that David should build God's house, that David should build the temple in Jerusalem. And so God gives a short history to David through Nathan through a series of questions. Verse 6, For I have not inhabited a house since the day I brought up the sons of Israel from Egypt, even to this day. But I have been going about in a tent, even in a tabernacle. Wherever I have gone about with all the sons of Israel, did I speak a word with one of the tribes of Israel, which I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? I want you to notice here the amazing condescension of God. What God is basically saying is, My people have been in a tent, so I'll be in a tent. I'll be with them. I'm not demanding something that I'm not giving to them also. He's been with them, and in his tremendous love for Israel, God's first concern is to make a place for them. That God won't rest until his people have rest. And now God completely flips this thing around. David has said, I want to build God a house. But God says no, and in fact, God's going to turn the tables on David. First, God reminds David of where David came from. Verse 8, So now, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says Yahweh of hosts, I myself took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you have gone, and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make you a great name, like the name of the great men who are on the earth. That God took David from shepherding sheep to shepherding the people of God. Shepherding Israel. And God has given great success to David all around him. But why is this? And and how is God going to turn the tables on David? 
God has given success to David for the sake of Israel. Verse 10, And I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them that they may dwell in their own place and not be disturbed again. And the unrighteous will not afflict them anymore as formerly. How is God going to plant Israel so that they're never disturbed again, never afflicted again? Here's how God's going to do that. And here's how God turns the tables on David. David has said, I'm going to build you a house, God. And God says, no, David, I'm going to build you a house. In verse 11, even from the day that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies, Yahweh also declares to you that Yahweh will make a house for you. Now, what this shows, by the way, is that our God is very different than all the false gods of the world. In ancient cult religions, kings who built temples for their favorite deities did so in order to curry future favor from that deity. It went something like this in the logic of the pagan king. My God has given me power and dominion. Therefore, I will build him a magnificent temple so that in the future, my God will do even more for me and give even more to me. But Yahweh is the opposite. David has received much favor from the true and living God. Now he's promised more favor, future favor. And the temple for God will have to wait until later because God's priority isn't his own house. God's priority is to graciously build a future for his beloved people of Israel. And he's going to do this through his covenant with David. And I I don't think we can miss the picture of the grace of God. That God doesn't let David do something that could be seen as placing any sort of claim on God's good favor. David is the recipient solely. There's no, there's no trade-off back and forth. There's no uh, God saying, well, you did build me this big temple, so I guess I'll go ahead and bless you. There's no trade-off. David is the recipient of God's grace without having done anything for God. And so David is forbidden from building a house for God. But God's going to build a house, a dynasty for David. God's going to exalt David, not for David's sake, but for Israel's sake. David is the means by which God will provide a permanent future posterity for the nature as a whole, the nation as a whole. And through the Davidic covenant, God is going to eventually bring in a new age, an age which ends all terror and all pain and all anguish for Israel. And so that's the promise of the Davidic covenant. And we've already seen some of the details, but we'll move on now and look at the details of the Davidic covenant. The the main meat of the covenant is found beginning in verse 12. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up one of your seed after you who will come forth from your own body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him and he will be a son to me. When he commits iniquity, I will reprove him with the rod of men and the, and the strikes from the sons of men. But my loving kindness shall not be removed from him as I removed it from Saul, whom I removed from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. Now, some of the promises, more of the preliminary promises given in earlier verses in some measure, are fulfilled in David's lifetime. And you remember last time we saw that in the Abrahamic covenant, God fulfilled many of the promises to Abraham while Abraham was still alive because that gives us confidence that the ones that come many years and decades and centuries later will be fulfilled in the same way. And so some of the promises are fulfilled in David's lifetime. For example, verse 9, he's promised a great name. I will make you a great name. 2 Samuel 8.13 records one particular battle after which it was declared that David made a name for himself. That's because God gave him victory and God made a name for him. So he's given a great name. He's also promised a place for God's people in verse 10. In David's time, Israel was closer to the boundaries established by God's covenant with Abraham than they had ever been, and really would ever be again in history. God's people were more secure than ever before because David was continually conquering enemies, subduing them. Israel lived in relative peace, certainly compared to the time of the judges. 
And then God promised rest from oppression. In verse 11, I will give you rest from all your enemies. This is at least partially fulfilled even during this time. In verse 1, Yahweh had given them rest on every side from all his enemies. At least in this era, in David's reign, there is peace all around him. But then there were promises which were fulfilled and realized and will be fulfilled and realized after David's death. He's promised a house. A house in the sense of a dynasty being established. You can't establish a dynasty while you're still alive. And so, verse 11, Yahweh will make a house for you. He's promised a seed. In verse 12, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up one of your seed after you. This is a stacked term which has multiple references. The seed references first Solomon himself, then to all the royal offspring of David who are faithful, and finally to the truest one so often called the son of David, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. So there's, there's a stacking of these terms. He's promised a house, he's promised a seed, he's promised a kingdom. Verse 13, he shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Solomon would build the house, the temple of God. But now we're venturing into the messianic realm because Solomon's kingdom was certainly not established forever. The throne he sat upon, the throne of David was established, but not Solomon's. Solomon's descendant, Joseph, the legal father of Jesus, but he wasn't the biological father. So Solomon's influence would end, but he would build a house. Jesus' biological claim to the throne of David came through his mother, Mary, through another one of David's sons, Nathan. Verse 16 indicates that this house of David and the kingdom of Israel will endure forever. David's throne established forever, and this is an earthly political kingdom, which I'm going to uh, prove to you here in some other passages. Now, here's a question. I, I think it's so important to put yourselves in the, in the place of people in the Bible and to think logically from their vantage point. How would David have thought of all this? When, when God promises him these things, a, a house, a seed, a kingdom, would David have said to himself, well, this is probably going to be fulfilled actually in heaven when my descendant reigns spiritually and invisibly over the earth during the church age. Of course he wouldn't have thought that. David understood this literally. First of all, he's in awe that God has made promises to him of this magnitude. This is not just God promising to give you a good week. This is not God promising to even bless your lifetime. This is God promising to, bl- to bless your family forever. That's beyond comprehension. And he says this in verse 18. Then David the king went in and sat before Yahweh and he said, Who am I, O Lord Yahweh, and what is my house that you have brought me this far? And yet this was a small thing in your eyes, O Lord Yahweh, for you have spoken also of the house of your slave concerning the distant future. And this is the law of man, O Lord Yahweh. And again, what more can David say to you? And you know your slave, O Lord Yahweh. For the sake of your word and according to your own heart, you have done all this greatness to let your slave know. For this reason, you are great, O Lord Yahweh. For there is none like you and there is no God besides you according to all that we have heard with our ears. And what nation on the earth is like your people Israel, whom God went to redeem for himself as a people and to make a name for himself and to do a great thing for you and awesome things for your land before your people whom you have redeemed for yourself from Egypt, from nations and their gods. He's, he's in awe that his family has promised this blessing and, and he understands and knows and he, and he says this, that he knows it's not just for him, it's for Israel. That he is the vehicle upon which God's future blessing to Israel will ride. But it's very clear that David took God literally. This is not an amillennial idea of a king ruling invisibly from heaven. Verse 19 He speaks of the distant future that God will establish Israel with a Davidic king on the throne. And how long will this go? Verse 24. You have established for yourself your people Israel as your own people forever. Verse 26. That your name may be magnified forever. 
Verse 29, so now be pleased and bless the house of your slave that it may be forever before you. For you, O Lord Yahweh, have spoken and with your blessing may the house of your slave be blessed forever. David understood that the house of David will rule over Israel on this earth in the distant future. There is no other option how he would have understood this. Some say that Jesus is reigning now on the throne of David from heaven and that the kingdom is now. Oh, there's a major problem with that. This means that Jesus is reigning from a throne, from a location that David never did. Therefore, it's not David's throne. The eminent Dr. John Walvoord, premillennialist extraordinaire, he wrote this. There is no confusion in David's mind between his own throne and his own physical descendants and the throne of God in heaven and the people of God as a whole. The familiar pattern of trying to make this promise refer to the heavenly throne and every believer instead of to the political throne of David and his physical descendants is the result of reading into the passage what it does not say and in fact contradicts. The throne of David is an earthly throne relating to a political direction of Israel, not a heavenly throne on which David himself never sat. This covenant is literal and it's unconditional. In fact, I'd like to show you two lines of evidence to this effect. The first is right here in our text. Verses 14 and 15 clearly refer to Solomon because of the reference to sin. Verse 14, I will be a father to him and he will be a son to me. When he commits iniquity, I will reprove him with the rod of men and the strikes from the sons of men. But my loving kindness shall not be removed from him as I removed it from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Solomon is a foreshadowing of Christ in that Solomon will build the physical house of God, just as Jesus will build the household of God, the spiritual house of God, made up of people who are the temple of the Holy Spirit. But I want you to know this there, that God promised chastisement for disobedience. But he says that he will never, ever remove his grace. He'll never remove his covenant love from Solomon. Now, why is this so important? It's almost like God anticipated the amillennial argument that disobedience cancels covenants. God says, no, it doesn't. This is an unconditional covenant. The second line of evidence, which is found in Psalm 89, turn with me to Psalm 89. This is the most overtly Davidic covenant psalm out of the many which refer to the Davidic covenant, and there's dozens of them. Psalm 89 makes it abundantly clear that the kingdom refers to David and that the people of Israel, the people of Israel, that it's unconditional in nature and there will be a literal fulfillment. Now, Psalm 89 was written by Ethan the Ezraite, meaning a descendant of Zerah. And Ethan lived at the same time as Solomon. They lived at the same time. And he lived to see also the failed reign of Solomon's son, Rehoboam. And in the fifth year of Rehoboam's reign, Shishak, the king of Egypt, invaded and he ransacked the king's palace. He humiliated the dynasty of Solomon. 1 Kings 14, 2 Chronicles 12 records this, but he didn't actually conquer and take over the nation. He just came in and humiliated the king and then left. Look at Psalm 89, 44. You have made his splendor to cease and cast his throne to the ground. This is the king being humiliated. Near the end of the psalm, Ethan is crying out to God, expressing the feeling that God has abandoned his people. Verse 46, How long, O Yahweh, will you hide yourself forever? Will your wrath burn like fire? And then he calls to mind the Davidic covenant, the covenant made with David just a few decades before Psalm 89 is written. Verse 49, Where are your former loving kindnesses, O Lord, which you swore to David in your faithfulness? But Ethan is expressing how this invasion and this humiliation felt. He's expressing the emotion. He's expressing what he sees. He's expressing what it feels like. But he has theological underpinnings. He has a foundation upon which he builds his belief and his faith. Go all the way back to verse 3. Ethan quotes God. 
I have cut a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn to David my servant. I will establish your seed forever and build up your throne from generation to generation. And you see similar language in verse 28. My loving kindness I will keep for him forever and my covenant shall be confirmed to him. So I will set up his seed to endure forever and his throne as the days of heaven. Key words here. In those four verses, three times we get forever, forever, forever. We get from generation to generation as in the days of heaven, meaning days without end. All these indicate the clear unconditional nature of the Davidic covenant. And in fact, there's a a restatement of what we saw in 2 Samuel 7, 14 and 15, which dealt with Solomon. Psalm 89 acts almost like an extended commentary on 2 Samuel 7. This is going to sound familiar. It's going to sound expanded. Look with me at verse 30. If his sons forsake my law and do not walk in my judgments, if they profane my statutes and do not keep my commandments, then I will punish their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with striking. But I will not break off my loving kindness from him, nor deal falsely in my faithfulness. My covenant I will not profane, nor will I alter what comes from my lips. And... Like all the major covenants of the Bible, which have a sign attached to it, a repeatable, observable sign, it seems from Psalm 89 that God gave David a sign really similar in size and scope to the rainbow of God's covenant with Noah. Verse 35, Once I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His seed shall endure forever and his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever like the moon and the witness in the sky is faithful. The sign of the Davidic covenant, God's faithfulness to his promises seems to be the sun and the moon and the stars themselves. They are the faithful witness of God's intention to keep this covenant. And in fact, you know this in verse 34. God calls this covenant holy to him. This covenant, my covenant, I will not profane. That if God breaks this covenant, he's profaning that which is holy. In verse 35, he swears by his own holiness. Now put all this together and the evidence is very clear that God's covenant with David is literal. It's unconditional. David didn't see this covenant as somehow being fulfilled spiritually and invisibly by his descendant ruling from heaven As amillennialism states, the Davidic covenant proves that God will bring a king from his body to the earth to be the king of all the kings. So that's the promise of the Davidic covenant and the details of the Davidic covenant. Now, the whole point of tonight is to get to the connection to the millennium. What does this have to do with the millennium? If God's covenant with David has direct connection to the coming millennial reign of Christ on earth, we should expect to find this connection somewhere in Scripture. We should expect to find Christ and David and millennium grouped together, shouldn't we? And so for the remainder of our time, I want to just tour with you some of those connections. We'll just have a spirit of curiosity and see if we find some passages where Christ, David, and millennium are all bound up together. We'll just stop in and visit briefly seven passages to satisfy this curiosity. Turn with me to Isaiah 9, Isaiah 9, verse 6. First, we'll wish ourselves a Merry Christmas by looking at this passage that's so familiar to us during the holiday season, Isaiah 9, 6. Imagine that it's much colder as we read this. Isaiah 9, verse 6. And in all these passages, we're just going to ask three simple questions. Do we see Christ? Do we see Davidic covenant elements? And do we see millennium, millennial kingdom elements? Isaiah 9, 6. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, And the government will rest on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness. From then on and forevermore, the zeal of Yahweh of hosts will accomplish this. So the three questions, do we see Christ? Well, obviously, he's the child born to us, the son given to us. And by the way, in context, us is Israel specifically. Do we see elements of the Davidic covenant? 
the throne of David, the kingdom of David. This, it's obvious, it's blatant here. And do we see millennial kingdom, kingdom on earth elements? Well, Christ is ruling the government of the world. He has the government on his shoulders. He's the supreme king of all the kings. We even get the, the character of his reign. His reign is characterized by wisdom, since he's the wonderful counselor. It's characterized by power, because he's the mighty God. It's characterized by protection, because he's the eternal father. It's characterized by peace, because he's the prince of peace. And here's a, an important key for us. Justice and righteousness will characterize his reign. What does that mean? It means there will be unbelievers in the kingdom, descendants of the survivors of the great tribulation, because there's no need for justice when there are no sinners. Does that make sense? Justice must happen when judgment is happening. Turn to Jeremiah 23. And we'll just keep going in order that the Bible gives us these passages here. Jeremiah 23, verse 1. God is pronouncing a curse, a woe on unrighteous shepherds and leaders of Israel who mislead and cause spiritual destruction of God's people. These unrighteous shepherds have caused God's people to be punished by God, scattered, banished. Jeremiah 23, woe to the shepherds who are destroyed and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declares Yahweh. Therefore, thus says Yahweh, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who are shepherding my people, you have scattered my flock and banished them and have not attended to them. Behold, I am about to attend to you for the evil of your deeds, declares Yahweh. So what's God going to do about this? Verse 3. Then I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the lands where I have banished them and cause them to return to their pasture and they will be fruitful and multiply. I will raise up shepherds over them and they will shepherd them and they will not be afraid any longer nor be terrified nor will any be left unattended, declares Yahweh. But how will God accomplish this? How will God make this time happen when Israel is regathered and righteous shepherds are now attending to the sheep of God's flock? Verse 5. Behold, the days are coming, declares Yahweh, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch and he will reign as king and prosper and do justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell securely. And this is his name by which he will be called Yahweh, our righteousness. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, declares Yahweh, when they will no longer say as Yahweh lives who brought up the sons of Israel from the land of Egypt, but as Yahweh lives who brought up and brought back the seed of the household of Israel from the north and from all the lands where I banished them, then they will live on their own soil. So, do we see Christ? He's the righteous branch raised up as king. He is called Yahweh our righteousness. This is the righteous branch who is God himself. Do we see elements of the Davidic covenant? The righteous branch is raised up for David and from David. And do we see elements of the millennial kingdom? Christ is reigning as king. He does justice and righteousness in the land. See also Isaiah 9. Judah and Israel are now unified once again. And now, and, and this is phenomenal. Verse 7 tells us now the exodus. God's rescue of Israel from slavery in Egypt. The exodus is no longer the greatest thing that ever happened to Israel. But her regathering under the righteous branch is now the great boast of Israel. And notice the emphasis on the land. Verse 5, in the land. Verse 8, then they will live on their own soil. All three together. Turn a few pages forward to Jeremiah 33. Jeremiah 33, 14. Jeremiah 33 guarantees that God will pardon Israel someday. God will cleanse their sin. In verse 8, He'll make Israel a wonder before all the nations. And in fact, the nations will tremble because Israel is so blessed by God. In verse 9, but beginning in verse 14. Behold, days are coming, declares Yahweh, when I will establish the good word which I have spoken concerning the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time I will cause a righteous branch of David to branch forth and he shall do justice and righteousness on the earth. 
In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will dwell in security. And this is the name by which she will be called. Yahweh is our righteousness. For thus says Yahweh, David shall not have a man cut off from sitting on the throne of the house of Israel. Do we see Christ? He is the righteous branch. Once again, verse 15. Do we see elements of the Davidic covenant? Christ is the righteous branch of David. In verse 17, David shall not have a man cut off from sitting on the throne of the house of Israel. Do we see elements of the millennial kingdom? The reunification of Israel and Judah, again, Christ shall do justice and righteousness where? Verse 15, on the earth. Not in heaven, on the earth. We see Jerusalem dwelling in security. We see a throne in Israel. And one little bonus question here. Do we see elements of the new covenant? Jerusalem will have a nickname. Yahweh is our righteousness. Doesn't that remind you of 2 Corinthians 5.21? He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become what? The righteousness of God in him, in Christ. In other words, Jerusalem will have a nickname. Yahweh is our righteousness, which is basically, Hi, I live in the city called justification by faith alone in Christ alone. Turn to Ezekiel 37. We have in Ezekiel 37 this famous vision of the valley of dry bones brought back to life. And God gives the meaning of this vision. Ezekiel 37, beginning in verse 12. We'll start in verse 11, rather. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say our bones are dried up and our hope has perished. We are completely cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says Lord Yahweh, Behold, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves, my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am Yahweh when I have opened your graves and caused you to come up out of your graves, my people. And I will put my spirit within you and you will come to life and I will place you on your own land. Then you will know that I, Yahweh, have spoken and done it, declares Yahweh. This already sounds very millennium-like, doesn't it? I want you to know this further down in verse 24. Now we get an interesting little surprise. Not really surprising when you think about it logically and theologically, but let's walk through the little surprise. Ezekiel 37, 24. And my servant David will be king over them. And they will all have one shepherd and they will walk in my judgments and keep my statutes and do them. They will inhabit the land that I gave to Jacob, my servant, which your fathers inhabited, and they will inhabit it, they and their sons and their sons' sons forever. And David, my servant, will be their prince forever. Now, many would say that my servant David in these two verses is a reference to Christ, who is the Davidic king. That's a reasonable view. I believe this is actually David himself. Now, let me give you several reasons. I narrowed it down to four. We'll try and do just four. First of all, these two verses are very specific that the rule of David is over Israel only. In fact, he's called Israel's prince as well as their king, a leader over one nation only. Yes, Jesus is the king of Israel, but he's also the king over all the kings. And in fact, there's biblical precedent multiple times in the Old Testament for co-regencies. David and Solomon reigned at the same time for a period of time. There was a training period. There was overlap. And so there's precedence for this. A second reason that's very logical to us if we think about our theology, David by now is resurrected. Logically speaking, does anyone really think that David will be assigned in the millennial kingdom to anything other than being the leader of Israel? Is he going to be the official treasurer for India or the secretary of state for South Africa? No. Here's a third reason. If you see the David mentioned in verses 24 and 25 as Christ, the one who is God dwelling with his people, then you run into a problem in verses 26 and 27. 
And I will cut a covenant of peace, verse 26, with them. It will be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will give them the land and multiply them. And will set my sanctuary in their midst forever. My dwelling place also will be with them. And I will be their God and they will be my people. What is the problem we run into here? God the Son, the Messiah, the King of all the kings will also be there. God speaks of David in the third person and himself in the first person, two different people. One more line of evidence. Other passages support this as David ruling in Jerusalem under the authority of Christ. Ezekiel 34, 24, I, Yahweh, will be their God and my servant David will be prince among them. I, Yahweh, have spoken. Yahweh, David, two different beings, two different people. There's a, this is a longer discussion that we'll have in a future message. But the millennial, millennial kingdom section in Ezekiel, Ezekiel 40 through 48, has references to a prince, which many take again as Christ. And I won't look at all the passages because there's some complexity to it. But just a couple of examples about the prince. Ezekiel 46, 4 says that this prince will bring a burnt offering to Yahweh. And the prince is differentiated from God, differentiated from Yahweh. In verse 12 of Ezekiel 46, the prince is offering several different offerings to Yahweh. Verse 16 of Ezekiel 46 speaks of this prince giving gifts to his sons. Verse 18 even gives a a rule of law that the prince is not to take from the people's possessions to give to his sons, that he'll be ruled by integrity and righteousness. Ezekiel 45, 7 and 8 gives the boundaries of the actual land which the prince will actually own personally. Now, this is an interesting problem because if you take the prince as being Christ, Christ owns everything already in Psalm 24, 1. So it would be pretty inconsistent to say that there's land that Jesus owns and a bunch of land that Jesus doesn't own. No, he owns all of it. But there are specific boundaries given to the land owned by the prince. Now we've gotten that issue dealt with in our original passage here, Ezekiel 37, 24 through 28 and and back in 15 through 18. Do we see Christ? First question. Verse 27, my dwelling place also will be with them. Verse 24, my judgments, my statutes. Verse 26, my sanctuary. Do we see elements of the Davidic covenant? David is the prince over Israel, named twice in verses 24 and 25. Do we see elements of the millennial kingdom? Tons of them. Verse 25, they will inhabit the land that I give to Jacob. Verse 26, I will give them the land. Verse 28, the nations will know that Christ is Yahweh who sets apart, who sanctifies Israel. Turn to Hosea chapter 3. Just a few pages forward. Hosea chapter 3, and you know the story of Hosea. God has commanded Hosea to marry what God calls in Hosea 1 2, a wife of harlotry. To be a living picture of Israel as having committed flagrant harlotry and forsaking God spiritually. His wife is wayward, his wife is sinful. And yet in chapter 3, Hosea is commanded to reach out to her once again. In marriage, as a demonstration of how God intends to allure Israel once again to himself. And here's the summary of what will happen to Israel. Hosea 3, verse 4. For the sons of Israel will remain for many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or sacred pillar, and without ephod or household idols. Afterward, the sons of Israel will return and seek Yahweh their God and David their king, and they will come in dread to Yahweh and to his goodness In the last days. Our three questions. Do we see Christ? We see Israel returning to seek Yahweh their God. The key word is return. That there is a regathering. Which in previous texts we've already seen. Is initiated by Jesus Christ. Do we see elements of the Davidic covenant? Israel will return to David the king. And do we see elements of the millennial kingdom? Listen by the time. Hosea writes, David's been dead for 200 years. So Israel's return to David must be a future time. And it certainly can't be speaking of the return from exile in Babylon. Because this phrase here in the last days, this references a future kingdom free of strife, 
free of war, free of pain. Pain that Israel has caused both for herself and endured at the hands of others. And Hosea is very, very accurate here. You notice that the throne of David will be unoccupied for a long time, but there always has been and will always be a legitimate heir to the throne, whether he sat on the throne or not. Now, this is a key important point. The throne of heaven, the heavenly throne, has always been in existence. The throne of David had a beginning point. It had a start point. A time, then it had a time when it was vacant. Never would we say that the throne of heaven has ever been vacant. And once again, the throne of David will be occupied with a resurrected David ruling and Christ as the king of all the kings. Let's go to the New Testament now. Turn to Luke chapter 1. In Luke 1, we mentioned this text in the previous message, but I just want to revisit it with the same three questions as the other texts. In Luke 1, the angel Gabriel is sent from God to visit the Virgin Mary, who is betrothed to Joseph. Merry Christmas once again tonight. Luke 1, beginning in verse 28. Luke 1, 28. And coming in, he, that is Gabriel, said to her, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at this statement and was pondering what kind of greeting this was. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and there will be no end of his kingdom. Same three questions. Do we see Christ? Pretty obvious. You shall name him Jesus. He shall be great, will be called the Son of the Most High. Do we see elements of the Davidic covenant? Pretty obvious again. The Lord God will, future, give him the throne of his father David. And do we see elements of the millennial kingdom? I have to point this out. The angel says he will reign over the house of Jacob. This always refers to ethnic Israel, never the church. The house of Jacob. And he says there will be no end of his kingdom. So Christ, David, millennial kingdom, wrapped up together. Turn to Acts chapter 15. Acts 15 one of my, my favorite references to the Davidic covenant because it kind of seems to come out of left field for us here. A church council has been called in Jerusalem here in the early church to deal with the issue now being brought up in the church with some Jews insisting that in order to come to faith in Christ, a Gentile must be circumcised and must keep the law of Moses. The first vestiges of legalism. Now, what I'm going to show you is What was their basis for saying that you must be a Jew before you can be a Christian? Their basis was believing that the kingdom was now. That the kingdom was happening now and that that the Davidic covenant was happening now and that you should act like it. I'll show you this in a minute. James, Jesus' half-brother and the author of the epistle of James. He's the head of the church in Jerusalem. He's the lead shepherd. And after some discussion, including with Barnabas and, and Paul, James issues a judgment. Acts 15, verse 13. Now, after they had stopped speaking, James answered, saying, Brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first concerned himself about taking from among the Gentiles a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written... After these things, I will return and I will rebuild the fallen booth of David and I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from long ago. Therefore, I judge that we do not trouble those who are turning to God from among the Gentiles. Why is Amos here being quoted? Amos 9 is quoted about the Davidic covenant. What does that have to do with whether or not Christians should be circumcised and whether or not they should keep the law of Moses? What is going on here? James quotes from Amos 9. He talks about the Davidic covenant and he answers the question which really is underlying the debate. Was the church age meant to bring about all the promises 
of the Davidic covenant? Was Israel still in the church age central in their focus of God's redemptive program? And James's answer is no. But I want you to notice the order of events which James cites from Amos 9. First of all, verse 14. God has in the church age, quote, concerned himself about taking from among the Gentiles a people for his name. That's the church age. That's the age we're in right now. Second, verse 16, after these things, after the church age, David's fallen tents will be restored. David's house and throne restored. And third, now the rest of mankind, all the nations will see and seek the Lord. What is this? This tells us that James was a premillennialist. So do we see Christ? We see him indirectly because when will the fallen tent of David be restored? It happens at the end of the great tribulation. Zechariah 12, 9 and 10 says, It will be in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication so that they will look on me who's speaking here whom they have pierced. Christ is speaking. And they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. And they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. The house of David is restored when Israel repents to their Savior. Do we see elements of the Davidic covenant? James's point is that the Davidic covenant is not happening in the church age. It's yet future. Christ is not reigning on the throne of David because the throne of David is on earth. And do we see elements of the millennial kingdom? All the nations knowing God and seeking God because Israel is restored. Now, I got to be honest with you. I picked my seven favorite passages. There were about 10 that I chose not to share tonight. Christ, David, millennium. Always wrapped up together. I want to bring this forward to our time. And I have two thoughts I'd like to leave you with. The first one is, I read earlier from Zechariah 12, Israel looking on him whom they have pierced. And I think it's important for us to remember that Israel is not the only one who crucified Christ. You did also. And so did I. It was necessary for him to die on the cross because of your sin. Your sin debt was too great to pay. We always have to get back to the gospel. But in Christ, the one who comes by faith, as all Israel will, what does it mean to come to faith? It means that you're mourning over Christ, mourning over his necessary death. Can you even grasp that Christ had to die for you? That's beyond comprehension. All who come to faith not only have their sin debt paid in full, But now you're incorporated into the roster of the coming kingdom. You're part of this coming kingdom of Christ on earth. And so we always have to go back to that. These glorious visions of a coming kingdom. But how am I a part of it? How do I get to be part? And then the second application is familiar to you. I, I suppose I'll bring this up continually throughout our series in the millennium. The whole point of prophecy in Scripture is to show God's perfect plan in a miraculous, predictive fashion and to point you continually to the future. That's where our our affections are to be. Do you remember and do you know what your destiny in Christ is? Do you think about this? What happens to you when Christ is manifested on the earth someday? Do you remember what happens to you when Christ comes back? Colossians 3, 4 says, when Christ, who is our life, is manifested, then you also will be manifested with Him in glory. That all that you were meant to be, all that God created you to be, the sinless version of you, the the glorious version of you, that will be manifested when Christ comes. I want to challenge you to take Paul's admonition two verses earlier, to set your mind on the things above, to take this seriously by consciously purposefully thinking about the redemptive plan of God to return to this earth, to reign as the king of all the kings, and the fact that you will be here. I I want you to put this in your mind every single day. This is not just a, a dry theological discussion. This is something that should permeate your thoughts. 
The other day, I was opening a little package of blueberries, and there were a few blueberries in there that were like, like nuclear blueberries. They're like the size of small plums. And my thought was, I'll bet they're all this way in the millennium. Everything you do can be related to the millennium. Every time you suffer, this won't happen in the millennium. Every time something goes badly, this won't happen in the millennium. Every time you have to deal with an unrighteous ruler, this definitely won't happen in the millennium. I believe with all of my heart that every day, millennial thoughts should permeate your mind and your heart. And that's my prayer. Why are we taking literally a couple of years to talk about the millennium? Because I want you to not be able to get away from it. I want you to be thinking about your future on this earth with a glorious king who is perfect. I hope that it forever changes your vision into future vision and future hope. You see, someday you're going to get to shake David's hand. You'll get to meet him and his faithful sons. Ezekiel 46 says this. Maybe you'll get to tour the land owned by David, land which goes from Jerusalem all the way to the Mediterranean Sea, 32 miles of land. And you can marvel, like David did, that God made eternal, everlasting, unconditional, literal promises to one man. And because of these promises, Christ will rule the world. But there's one more thing. Was there a time from a human standpoint, that the Davidic covenant hung by a thread? Was there a time when God would make certain that we will always know that God alone will bring about the coming kingdom? Was there a time when one evil man would seemingly threaten the entire future of the kingdom? Next time, we'll look at that. That one man who might threaten the Davidic covenant is named Goliath. And we need to look at that from a millennial standpoint. We'll do that next time. Let's pray together. Our Father, how eager we are for the coming kingdom and how much more joy we receive when we obey the Lord's admonition to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that's our prayer tonight. Come, Lord Jesus, may your kingdom come. Amen.